What's up guys, it's your host Spartanic Arts DxD back with another high school DxD related video. And today we have What If Issei Was the Son of Great Red Part 3 and we are on Chapter 5. Before I start this video, I want to know your opinion. My next series will consist of What If Naruto Was Betrayed and What If Issei Finally Lost It. I really want to know what do you think about the What If Issei Finally Lost It title. Do you think I should call it What If Issei Finally Lost It? Or what if Issei got betrayed and lost it? Either one, he does get betrayed in the story. Just if you guys want to know, it's kind of cool. I just want to let you guys know. I need to know your opinion. Please leave it down in the comment section down below. Tell me if you're also hyped for the Naruto one. Without further ado, please like, comment, and subscribe. Let's shoot for like 200 likes. And without further ado, let's go ahead and get right into it. Chapter 5. Friendship and a Promise. Flashback or some thinking? with Issei and Akino in the flashback. While both of their respective parents were having a discussion among themselves, Akino made her way towards Issei and marveled at his wings. So those are the wings of a dragon, she asked. Issei was a little confused, tilted his head a bit at her remark until he quickly realized what she meant. His four draconic wings were exposed and she got to see it. He became frightened at the thought that she would now back away from knowing that he wasn't human, but a monster. Although contrary to his belief, she just smiled at him and said, Wow, your wings are fascinating. They possess beautiful combination of crimson and black. Looking at his wings, Issei surprised. You're not afraid of me. I I thought you would be scared knowing I was a monster. He solemnly said to Akuna with his head down. She simply approached him and karate chopped his head and he, an oomph came out as he rumbled his head a bit. You're silly. Why would I be afraid of my friend? She would said a bit annoyed that he thought so little of their friendship. Issei could not believe it. Despite knowing what he is, she thought she would not shy away from him and still call him his friend. He was stupefied. The answer he guessed was completely off the mark. Looking at the expression of relief on his face brought her a smile to her face and she decided to reveal her little secret, although seeing that Issei already met her father and he would probably know that she isn't entirely human either. She spread out her two fallen angel wings back from her back Issei saw them, and only one thing came to mind. Wow, that's so pretty, he suddenly blurted out. Akino's cheeks blushed red at the statement he made. R really? She asked, knowing this was the first boy that complimented her, and, and she liked it. Can I touch them? He asked with sparkling eyes as he had never seen fallen angel wings before. Akino nodded and Issei quickly began to feel them, not knowing that Akino was slightly blushing since fallen angel wings are very sensitive. Amazing. They are so soft and fluffy in addition to being beautiful, he said speaking honestly from the heart, which again made Akino blush red at the compliments he gave. She then glanced at his wings and decided to also feel them. She was very curious considering that it is the first time she has ever met or even seen a dragon. Oof, your wings are big and strong, yet gentle to touch. The wings of a dragon indeed look splendid. She smiled at him when she said, which made him blush as well. Why didn't you tell me you were a dragon? She asked him. I was just afraid you would be scared of me knowing what I am. I guess it was unfounded. <laughs> he replied, scratching us on the back of his head. But seriously, thank you for accepting me as your friend. You have no idea how much it means to me. He continued looking at her straight eyes to show how serious he was with a big grin on his face, to which Akino again blushed a bit and replied, No problem. As I told you before, you are my friend, and that won't change no matter what race you belong to. Issei's heart was extremely relieved when he told her that. When he told him that. It felt as if a huge burden was lifted off his shoulders as he could not express how deeply thankful he is to Akino for it. A small silence premeditated after she said that, both not knowing what to say until Akino broke the silence. So... Do you want to continue playing? I have no idea how long our parents will keep talking to each other, she asked him, and Issei nodded, signaling that he agrees as they continue playing to each other. Back with the parents, after a long, adurgeous argument and many apologies being said, Shuri decided to break the ice to say, How about we continue our discussion inside? I was previously making tea and I would be happy if you would like to join us while the kids are playing together. Thinking a bit on the offer, Great Red accepted her offer and told him that he needed to talk to Orphis for a bit, then they would join them inside. Barkiel and Shuri both nodded and went inside, letting the two dragon gods talk amongst themselves. Great Red could tell that Orphis was still irritated over the previous events that transpired, so he wanted to try and calm her down as much as possible. Look. The fallen angel Barkil already apologized for the earlier incident against Issei, so how long are you going to let it lay to rest? Forgive them, and take this chance to get to know them better. He asked her, trying to get his best reason with her. Orphis, in response, glared at him, angry, replying, How do you expect me to forgive him after he nearly harmed our son? Seeing how stubborn she was, Great Red decided to try to a different approach. Huh. 
Okay. You know what? Fine. He said as Orphis raised her eyebrow a bit trying to understand what he meant. He just continued on. You can do whatever you want. If you really can't forgive them for their actions, then go ahead and do whatever you feel is right. I won't stop you. If you wish to get rid of them, or as I previously mentioned, we can erase their memories and put all of this behind us. However, look over there. She pauses. She pointed at e towards Issei. He waited until Orphis turned around and looked at towards their son and then continued. No, if you do this, then it will take away that small amount of happiness that Issei managed to earn during his stay here. Do you have a heart to do this? Like I said, I will adhere any choice you make. Great Red finished letting Orphis slowly taken his word. At first, Orphis was still infuriated, was hell on bet dealing with the fallen angel. Circumstances are not. No one gets away with threatening the life of her son. That was the promise that she made to herself when she was left at the dimensional gap. Nevertheless, after gaving at her son having fun with Akino, she slowly began to calm down, letting Great Red's words sink in. Would she be able to do this knowing the effect it would have on Issei? As she was debating with herself, she suddenly remembered something Issei told her back when he was defending Barkyol. Please don't do this. If you do, I will hate you. The mere thought of Issei hating her sent her emotions spiraling out of control. I can't let that insolent being... I can't let what that insolent being almost did to my little Issei go unpunished, but I won't... But I don't hate him. The mere thought of Issei... What do I do? She thought to herself. Never in her life has she ever encountered such troubles since the Ouroboros Dragon God. No sane being messed with her, but now it seems like the enemy is herself. Internally, she's stuck between two sides. Should she follow through with her promise or discard it for Issei? How ironic that she threatened Great Red to put Issei's well-being and happiness above including his crazy antics, and yet, he was only th thinking about Issei's happiness. While she is placing her pride above Issei, what cruel irony. In the end, she, in the end, she exhaled a sigh she exhaled a sigh of defeat, looking back at Great Red. You are right. I still don't think I can forgive him for what he's done to our son's happiness, but I will at least try to get along with them. At this, Great Red gave out a cheeky grin, although decided not to tease her about it since he, he knew how hard it was for her to admit he was right. Very well, let's not keep them waiting any longer. He said, dragged her inside the shrine while she saw Shuri preparing the table with tea, a few refreshments. When Shuri saw them walk in, she graced them with a smile and kindly invited them to join them. Please make yourself at home. I am almost done preparing tea, and there are a few cupcakes on the table. You are welcome to take some if you like. As the mention of the sweets, Orphus immediately bottled towards the table in a blink of an eye before anyone even noticed she was already munching on one. It took everything in Great Red's willpower not to just let go and laugh at the scene before him. Well, I guess that's one way to calm her down, he thought to himself as he took a seat next to her. He wouldn't admit it, but he found her action to be extremely cute. I didn't know you liked sweets so much, teased Great Red now spreading again. Orphus blushed a bit when she tried to quickly hide as she answered, Oh, shut up, you idiot, Red. Great Red, amused with her reaction, sprouted a small giggle, which Orphus noticed. But before she could re reprimand him, Shuri came back with a freshly prepared mint tea and began to serve both of them. In addition, she brought out some sake for her sake for her husband and for her guest in case they wanted some as well, as she is not familiar with the type of drinks dragons would want. Orphis, being ticked off by Great Red's behavior, decided to sit on the other end of the table. Shuri let out a small giggle, seeing her reaction, remembering that she used to do the same thing whenever her husband did something she didn't like, but it was often to tease him as his expressions were priceless. Plus, she got to administer her own punishment. Whenever Barkyul tried to make up with her, she then decided to join her and try to get her nowhere better. Seeing that Orphis was not interested in starting a conversation, she would have to take a break between the eyes between them. I take it this is how she usually behaves? She asked curiously. Orphus turned around, still annoyed by Great Red and answered. Unfortunately, unfortunately, seeing that she managed to start a conversation, Shuri poured tea for both of them until Orphus looked at the other bottle next to the tea and got curious what it was. What trick is that? As she pointed towards the bottle near the tea. Shuri took the bottle and answered, This is sake that my husband drinks. He usually drinks it whenever we have guests to sometimes help alleviate his mood whenever he gets depressed or agitated. Orphus, being a bit naive, took that statement quite literally and decided to try some since she was not very good mood at the present moment. After a few drinks of sake, 
day, she literally started pouring out of her pent-up feelings about Great Red. The dimensional gap was my home long before he ever knew it existed, yet he simply waddles and starts living there. He is extremely noisy, performing all his crazy maneuvers, and then when I told you to get out of my house, he shrugs me off saying that there's enough space for both of them. The of them. What an annoying, obnoxious, noisy, loathsome. As Orphus kept swinging insult after insult about Great Red, letting everything out in the open, Shuri found her reaction to be absolutely adorable. It seems even a dragon god has worries, just like any other living being. Even worse, it seems my little Issei is slowly being corrupted by him. I saw him teach some of his annoying stunts back home. I can't allow Issei to end up like that idiot, Orphus exclaimed. Oof. In that case, why don't you punish him a bit? Isn't a wife's duty to discipline her husband whenever he does something stupid? Give him a good smack in the head to let him know how you feel, answered Shuri, letting a small grin appear on her face. You know what? You're right. I'm going to give him a piece of my mind, stated Orphus. You could tell that she was a bit drunk as she casually ignored the fact that she was called Great Red's wife, something that would have made her enraged a few months ago. Shuri simply giggled a bit as she followed Orphus towards their husbands. How's it like living in the dimensional gap? Asked Barkill as he took a sip of his sake. It's an amazing place that grants me freedom to do whatever I want. Answered Great Red as he remembered swimming unhinged through the dimensional gap while performing as many awesome moves as he could think of. Ah, those were the days. Oh, anything else interesting happened? Questioned Barkill. Great Red pondered him. Hmm. Other than Orphus constantly bugging me to get out of the dimensional gap, I don't think... Oh, wait, no. I remember one thing. Flashback. In the dimensional gap, a 20-meter purple dragon came up to Great Red. Great Red. My name is Tanin, the Blaze Meteor Dragon. I have recently been appointed the title of Dragon King, and I challenge you to a duel, said Dragon, revealed to be Tanin. After his declaration immediately started to assault Great Red with his renowned flame, that took the shape of a meteor easily bigger than Tanin. That attack hit Great Red, causing an explosion. However, out of the attack came the Great Red virtually unscathed, as he continued to fly across the dimensional gap, seemingly to have bruised aside Tanin's attack. To say that Tani was shocked would be an understatement. He knew that Great Red was the strongest dragon in existence, which is why he wanted to test his power against him, to see his limits. Yet, he could not believe that his full power couldn't even make Great Red notice him, let alone scratch him. What a monster of unparalleled strength. Completely ignorant of Tani's inner turmoil, the only thing that was going on in Great Red's mind was, hmm, did I hit something? That doesn't matter. Should I try to roll back this time? He was pondering about what crazy stunt to perform next. Flashback ended. Not sure if I bumped into something, but I do believe anything of value has occurred to me. Although that was the past, and now my actions are aligned with a single goal, and that is to give my son Issei the best life possible. Great Red with a genuine smile will think of his son. Barkill, understanding what he meant, responded with a smile of his own. I understand. My family is the best thing that ever happened to me. I will do anything to ensure their happiness. Looking at Shuri, who is busy making their conversation with Orphis. Although sometimes I fear my strength will not be enough to protect them from harm, he said as his face gloomy expression. Although raising his brow, from what I can tell, you've been doing a good job so far, so why why doubt now? Question Gate Red. It's not that simple. Throughout my life I have been made enemies. I have made enemies who would go to great lengths to harm me if given the chance. If by some chance they found out about my family, I dread to think of the horrors they would do to them. My greatest fear is that one day I am unable to protect them and pay the price for my mistakes. Barkil shivered at the thought. If you do not believe your strength is enough to defend them, then why not move to your organization, Gregor? I'm sure that they prevented fallen would that perverted fallen Azazel would help you since you are allies. I have considered that. However, my wife and I did not want Akino to live her life closed off from the outside. She would be able to grow up like a normal child, making friends, going to school, and I did not want to deprive her of her childhood. In addition, according to Azazel, there are traitors inside the Grigar, so if anything, they would be placed into an even more dangerous place. I cannot let them get caught in the crossfire. We opted to living there, in shrine away from prying eyes, Barkil explained to Great Red. Great Red did understand a bit Barkle was coming from. The only reason him and Orphis moved to the human world was to give Issei someone of a normal social life, and they keep 
themselves hidden in order not to attract attention towards them, however unlikely. They did not want Issei to get hurt. I see. For what it's worth, I think you are doing a great job at protecting your family, so my advice would be continue the best you can and everything should be alright. After all, no one, knows what the f no one knows what the future may hold, or what's in store for us, not even me. Therefore, the future you describe might not even come close to pass. Don't worry about it too much. Barku was a bit taken back by Great Red's wisdom, as he recalled how Azazel once described him as which man he did, and the giggle a bit. Heh, <laughs> you really are a lot of different, simple-minded dragon as Azazel described you to be. He said in a lower voice. However, with this enhanced hearing, Great Red managed to pick it up. Oh, did he now? He thought to himself as he flashed a bit of power with a grin on his face with no one wiser. In Grigor, in the Grigory, Azazel was conveniently taking a nap when all of a sudden his dream turned into the worst nightmares, where his vice governor Shimze, as well as the other fallen angel leaders, started destroying his laboratory and all of his creation, labeling them as dangerous. Then, all of a sudden, both of Seraph Gabriel and Mao Seraphal appeared both wearing evil grins as they brought forth a special collection of books in front of Azazel, who realized it was his porn collection that he kept stashed away. Both activated a fire spell, and quickly Azazel understood what they were going to do. No, Gabriel, Seraphal, please don't burn my treasury. I beg you, have mercy. It's all deaf ears as they sent the blaze in his collection. No! Azazel would continue to have his nightmares overflowing a week, which he had later dubbed the worst week of his entire existence, and for safety decided to have a variety of locks and spells to ensure to be very sure. Back at the shrine, talking with Great Red and Barkil. Great Red inherently laughed at the small prank he inflicted on Azazel. That's what you get for calling me simple-minded, you punk. Well, he used to be calling way worse by names by Orphus in the past. He will be damned if he allowed someone to mock him, Barkil, noticing his absent-minded expression again. Is something the matter? To which Great Red quickly replied, No, everything's alright. Anyways, where were we? Ah, yes. If would affiliate your worries a bit, how about I make a proposition? Should danger ever befall your family, give me a call and I will help you protect them. To say that Barkil was shocked would be an understatement. Did the strongest dragon just offer to protect his family? Why, why would... Stuttered Barkil before Great Red raised his hands, thereby interrupting Barkil to question. I know what you're going to ask and you tell her the truth, the primary and foremost reason I am doing this is for my son. Issei has befriended your daughter and if anything were to happen to you all, my son would be devastated and that is something that both Orphus and I would want to avoid at any cost. Barkil could not believe what he was hearing, and yet he could only briefest of hope that it was true. The Apocalypse Dragon was implying that he would help protecting his family, even if it was the interest of his son, which Barkil could understand his reasoning as he would do the same for his daughter. It would be pretty much the best protection for his family would ever get. He could not ever begin to describe how truly happy and grateful he was to the dragon, so he did and he bowed to him as deeply as he could. I am internally grateful for this. Truly, I would be in your debt if you would help me protect my family, responded Barkil. Great Red just motioned him to raise his head and answered, do not worry about it. Besides, all the... All of a sudden, someone hit the back of his head, thus running the current atmosphere, just ruining the current atmosphere to which around he saw Orphus perform the act. Hey, what the hell was that for? He asked while rubbing the back of his head. However, upon closer inspection, he noticed that Orphus' cheeks were flushed and she was swaying a bit, meaning that only one thing. Oh shit, is she drunk? I did not know it was even possible for a dragon god to get drunk, he thought to himself before Orphus interrupted his thoughts. That was for mocking me earlier. All the crazy, you st all the crazy stuff you put me through, she then proceeded to hit him again. Hey, why did you hit me again? Demanded Great Red. Because I felt like it. Ha, <laughs> she answered. Now sporting a bingo in her face, drunk or not, she felt great being able to smack him around. Great Red could tell that she was actually happy, and he would probably never admit it, but he found her expression to be incredibly cute, as for the first time he saw her as a beautiful woman. Barkley, who saw the little episode, tried to restrain his laughter, but unfortunately could not hold it back any longer. Ha! <laughs> you better get used to this, my friend. Unfortunately, that is, w that is the one, shall we say, inconvenience of having a white, he exclaimed. Ugh, oh, Ara, did you just say something I cannot ignore, my dear husband? It seems you are in need of a little punishment after this, Shuri exclaimed as she licked her lips in anticipation of hidden activities with her husband. Brockyl, knowing what she meant by punishment, blushed a bit. He was looking forward to it. His wife is a very big sadist, while he is a masochist, so in a way you could say they are indeed a perfect match. 
Ah, uh, yes. I mean, uh, Barkill could not think of anything as his mind went blank. On the side, he could hear Great Red laughing at him at the time around. Orphish just stared at her husband. Hmm, sure he has the right idea. Oh, what is this? Yes, became friends already, I see. That was fact considering is what you were talking about. Well, at least she is a million times more tolerable than you, Orphus exclaimed as she pointed towards him. Great Red clutched his chest in mock pain. Oh, you wound me, Orphus, he joked. Orphus decided to go along with it and responded, Well, it's about you felt pain for all that you have put me through. Everyone just laughed as they were all having a good time. Even Orphus had to admit herself she was enjoying the time they spent with them to fight the previous mishap. And so they continued talking to one another. And that's the end of Chapter 5, Friendship and promise. Chapter 6. Calm Before the Storm A certain distance away outside the shrine, the two children were playing amongst themselves. They were able to think of it on the spot. At the moment that the game happens to be hide and seek, currently Issei was seeking and Akana was hiding. 18, 19, 20? Ready or not, here I come. The games continued into a circle of distractions, and Jova out complaints as the two solidified their friendship. Over time, they had learned of each other's dislikes and likes, slowly building foundations of friendship over their simple talk. Both of them seemed to go on for hours, not seeming a bit tired due to how much fun they were having in the company of one another. Eventually, when both started to get exhausted, mostly Akano due to her human psychology, they decided to take a break while up while talking about their individual experiences. Issei talked about his experience in the dimensional gap, even though the small amount of training of he did, spanning from learning to use his swings and even breathing fire. I say breathing fire, but it's just a small spark compared to my parents, whose breath could engulf anything, brought in Issei. Well, at least it is a start. My father told me he was going to train me to use my holy lightning powers when he feels I'm ready. Other than that, I've helped my mother cleaning around the shrine and attended school, Akano responded. Is it fun going to school? Issei asked curiously. Akano thought about it before answering. It's okay. I spend my day playing with other kids, playing games with other kids. Sometimes they take us out to a different place like an amusement park or even to the zoo. Akano continued to talk about the different things she did in school to which Issei listened very intently. Did you make many friends, he asked. Although the mention of friends, he became a bit depressed recalling how every kid he met shunned him and wanted nothing to do with him. Akano, not noticing his inner turmoil, simply answered his query. I guess I did. Everyone was really nice to me and we all played together, so I guess it does make us friends, but she stopped to look at Issei and smiled. I think you would be my best friend, she said as Issei became a bit flustered at the motion of it. Really? But why? We've only recently met. You spent a lot more time with them than me, he asked, clearly not understanding why would she consider someone else she recently met as her best friend. I guess it's because with you, I can show who I really am. My parents always told me that I could not reveal who I am to others, and even though I do not understand why, anyways, with you, I don't need to hide my wings, and I can just be myself. Thank you, he answered as they continued joining their day. Eventually, the evening came and it was time to return home. Orphis and Great Red came out to get Issei and head home. Barkil and Shuri followed them to say farewell to get their own daughter. Issei, it's time to go, Orphis called out to her son. Oh, already? Can't we stay for a bit more? Issei pleaded with his mom, but she would not relent. Unfortunately not, Issei. It is getting very late and it's time to return home. Issei started pouting at his mom's age, to which everyone thought he looked absolutely adorable. Shuri stepped in. Oh. You know, you could come by any time you want. We would be pleased to have you here, and I'm sure Akana would love to spend more time with you, she told Issei, giving him and Akana both the wink to which they both blushed. Barkil also added, Yes, as my wife mentioned, we would be honored if you would come back. Despite starting off on the wrong foot, we had a great time today, and we hope you did as well. Great Red Fall Orphis, needing to accept what he said. Indeed, although at first I did not know what would happen, we had a marvelous time with you both, and we hope to get along very, very well, Great Red said with a smile on his face as he took Barkil's hand. At least, they offer better company than you, mocked Orphis, to which everyone started giggling at her joke. Before Great Red could defend himself, Issei interrupted. Yes, this is so awesome. Issei started jumping up and down, clearly illustrating how happy he was that the first time his friend, his first friend, is not over. Both parents could not help but giggle at Issei's answer making him look absolutely adorable. After calming down, he went over to Akana to say farewell. It looks like I have to go. I had an amazing time with you today, Akana. I hope we can spend more time together. Yes. I also 
had an amazing time with you, and I hope to come visit very soon. She responded, she gave him a hug, which he reciprocated. After separating, they all bid each other good night as Orphis, Great Red, and Issei returned home to rest. After they left, Shiri looked towards her daughter with a small grin. Oh, it seems somebody has caught your fancy, Akano, giving her a small wink to which Akano started blushing. Mom, it's not like that. We are just friends, she said, although a smart part of her did not seem to agree with what she thought. Both Shiri and Barkle just laughed at their daughter's reaction as they went back into their home as a curtain fell on yet another day two years later so this is a whole entire two years later two years have gone by since then and their friendship became stronger than ever in fact they both developed a crush towards one another yet oblivious of each other's feelings yet they were perfectly happy spending time with one another as much as possible their parents however were well aware of the feelings shared between them and were very happy for them. Orphus and Great Red could see the joy in Issei's expression every time he spent with Akano. They wished for nothing for than Issei's happiness and are ecstatic to see him growing up so well. The same could be said for Barkyul and Shuri. They were absolutely overjoyed that she found someone that she could be herself and not hide her identity. They could see the smile she gives him as well the few blushes she excludes whenever she compliments her or over anything. Both parents could tell that each one of them had a crush on one another and it was only a matter of time before they got together. The biggest change that occurred during the t this time frame was Orphus and Great Red have finally cemented their relationship as mates. Throughout the years, Great Red had seen so many of new sides of Orphus that he never dreamed existed, and little by little, he started to fall in love with her. Orphus, on the other hand, saw that there is more to the Apocalypse Dragon than she had thought. Seeing him taking things seriously with Issei, she slowly started to gain respect for the dragon, eventually stopped calling him an idiot. Eventually, those feelings were respect, grew into feelings of love. One day, Great Red gathered the courage and admitted his feelings for Orphus, but was extremely surprised when she reciprocated them which marked the beginning of their relationship as mates. Of course, T Issei t being so young, nothing had changed since they were still his mother and father and didn't see any problems with it. Both of them found it hilarious when Shuri and Barkil found out that they weren't married despite having a child. Nevertheless, that did not stop Shuri from suggesting that they held a wedding for their union. Even if it's just amongst themselves, both dragons tried to argue with her that, that becoming mates is different than humans and there is no need for a ceremony, but after never-ending perseverance, they finally succumbed to her decision and decided to hold a small ceremony at the shrine amongst themselves, with Akino being the flower girl while Issei brought their rings. In the end, it was a very special day and they thanked Shuri for organizing it in which she was very happy to do for her friends. Back to the present day, Issei and Akino were ta t taking a trip to the zoo alongside Barkul and Shuri to enjoy their day before they head back to the shrine with both, where both families will have supper together. As they were looking around, Akino told Issei, it's a shame your parents couldn't join us. Issei smiled at her replied and said, yeah, however, that could not be helped. You remember what happened last time we all came together the last time they all visited the zoo the moment both dragon gods entered the area all animals immediately went and hid in their habitats no one understood what happened but the animals were incredibly frightened by the presence of both dragons which caused their flight instincts to pick up and immediately retreated in their homes so he could still recall the funny outburst his dad had flashback in front of the lion's den his dad tried to get the lions to come out of hiding you're supposed to be the king of the jungle yet you are acting like a Bunch of scaredy cats get the hell out of here and show that lion's pride you pussy in the background you all could hear was the lion's frightened whimpers as great red kept insulting every animal to come out nevertheless Issei was very sad he could not see any animals and his parents were sad that the because of it they told him that they should go another time with akino and her family with them so they could have fun end of the flashback so back to the present where Issei's talking to akino as Issei was going down memory lanes, Akino poked him, interrupting his thoughts and bringing him back to reality. Let's go pet the baby bunnies in the pen, they are absolutely adorable. Without waiting his approval, Akino bolted towards the bunny pen, which made Issei laugh at how excited she was. Looking back, he saw that even her parents were giggling at their daughter's excitement, taking pictures to commemorate the day. They even took pictures of Issei in order to send them to his parents, as they could hear the joy of the day it would make them. Making him towards her, making his way towards her, he saw her petting a few baby bunnies, snorting out a beautiful smile, which caused him to blush a bit. When he tried to pet the bunnies, however, he saw them jerk away from it, frightened by his touch. Although saddened from this, he understood that 
From their perspective, he could not seen as anything else but a monster, which is something he could not change no matter what. Akino, seeing his grief, decided to try and alleviate the issue. She suddenly grabbed his hand and greatly surprised Issei, who turned to face is asking what's going on. She simply nodded. Still, wearing that comforting smile on her face as she slowly brought his hand towards the baby bunny she was petting. Seeing the same reaction occur, she gently caressed the bunny's head to try to calm it down. Don't worry, he isn't going to hurt you. Issei is a gentle guy, he would not do anything to harm you. There, there. Seeing the bunny calming down, she slowly brought it towards his palm. Issei was very nervous, although appreciative of what Akina was doing, that it would be a useless endeavor. The bunny started sniffing the palm of Issei's hand as if it was trying to judge whether or not it was safe. Eventually, to Issei's surprise, the bunny made its way towards Issei's hand. Issei was suddenly blown away by what happened. He was ever so greatly gently petted to the bunny, hoping it not to scare it away. There, you see? You just need to see that you are a gentle person, and they would no longer be afraid, Akano told him. Look towards her with the brightest smile he had ever seen and possesses. Thank you so much, Akano. He told her as she also gave him a smile. As they were gazing at one another, they heard some clicking sounds in the background. Click, click. They both turned around to see what was going on to see Shuri and Barkyo smirks on their faces taking pictures of them. Ah, oh, it seems we are interrupted at our daughter's moment with Issei. Please, don't mind us and keep going, Shuri told them, still keeping her smirk while winking at Akino. Both in Issei and Akino, cheeks were quickly turned crimson as Akino shouted, Mom! Both parents just laughed at their daughter's reactions as they continued visiting the different animals in the zoo. It was especially funny when Issei started a random stare down with the Konomoto dragon which Bartol took pictures of to send to his parents. When Akino asked him what he was doing, he answered that he didn't really know why, but he felt he would somehow lose if he was to first to look away. Eventually, their visit came to an end, and it was time to go back to the shrine. Overall, he had a wonderful time, which was shared by Akino and her family, and he could not wait to tell his parents about it. Making their way towards the shrine, they met up with Great Red and Orphis, who surprisingly was dressed up for the occasion and wearing a beautiful black dress, which made her look absolutely stunning. That Barkle could not help but stare at her for a moment, which caused caused him to get a slap on the back from his wife who whispered in his ear, I'll punish you for that later, idiot, causing him to shiver down his spine with both fear and excitement. After a few minutes of walking, they arrived at their destination. Shiri quickly began preparations for dinner with Barkill helping her out. Seeing that it was going to take time before supper was ready, Orphus called out to the kids. Issei, why don't you take Akino outside to play while we prepare for dinner? Just be sure to be back in around one hour. Dinner should be ready by then. Okay, Mom, where would you like to go, Akino? Issei asked her. Hmm. How about we go to the park? It's been a while since we've been there, she answered him. Issei nodded and they went on their way. Arriving at the park, they noticed that they were the only ones there, which is normal considering that no parents would let their kids out so late into the evening, but all that's meant is that they had the entire playground for themselves. As they were playing, they started to make idle conversation to pass the time. I aced my last quiz in Japanese. My parents were so happy that they posted it on our fridge. It's a bit embarrassing how they over-exaggerate almost everything I do, she told them as she scratched the back of her head. Wow. You are smart and you are pretty, he said so innocently, not realizing the automatic blush it caused Akino to stagger in response. Thanks, Issei, recomposing herself. She continued, how about you? Has anything interesting happened? Not really. My dad has been making me work out to enhance my physical strength even though I wanted to learn new skills. His tone turned into pouting as he continued. But dad said that I am still way too young and my body is still too weak to be able to withstand the power sleeping within me. It's not fair. I want to be able to do cool moves that my parents can do. He started waving his hands and everything showing how frustrated he was and all that did was make him look absolutely adorable to Akin who simply giggled. Ah, your reaction is absolutely adorable, Issei. Emphasizing his name as she gave him a win causing his blush this time but still could manage to continue the conversation also i did ask my parents that they would allow me to attend school so i could be able to experience what you but they're still reluctant for me to go i think i can understand the reason they did not want you to go they are scared that you will re-experience what happened to you in the past and they don't want you to feel hurt due to their actions akino stated as easy remembered the past and where everyone treated him like the plague wanted nothing more to do with him which made him feel extremely sad this is not something he wants to experience ever again and yet he looks towards Akino and smiled at her. I am very grateful to them for thinking about my well-being, but I am a dragon and I must keep moving forward. I cannot let my past define me, my future, so I will face any obstacle head-on and besides. 
I have you as my best friend, which makes me very happy. So even if I cannot make other friends or they avoid me, I can content with what I have. He told her with absolute certainty, once again causing Akino's cheeks to turn crimson. All of a sudden, before she could properly answer him, Issei's instance suddenly warned him of danger. As the sky suddenly turned purple, and all the presence of humans apart from Akino were gone, a barrier has been erected around them and he knew this could not be good for anything. What is going on? A Akino asked worriedly. Akino, get behind me and stay close to me. Akino, understanding the severity of the situation, simply nods and positions herself behind him. Although he was still a bit frigid by the situation, which Issei could not blame her for as he had too, was a bit scared. Then... From all around them, multiple people came out from the bushes and began surrounding both of them. It didn't take a genius to figure out that they were responsible for trapping them in this barrier. Issei was trying his best to remain calm and analyze the present situation at hand. He tried to sense who these beings were as they did not feel like humans, but the questions was answered when their backs spawned like bat-like scaly wings, and this helped Issei determine which species they are a part of. They were devils. And that is the end of chapter 6 calm before the storm all right so that's where we're going to be stopping we ended on chapter six and we will be continuing on to chapter seven as of next time now before i put like thank you guys so much for all the support as I really want to thank you for reaching 20,000 subscribers and the 20k special will consist of what if Naruto was betrayed and what if Issei finally lost it or what if Issei was betrayed and finally lost it which means he just lets loose. So again please tell me which title to prefer out of those with the what if Issei one and please please expect the what if Naruto was betrayed one it is coming out very soon. I wanted to push this out first because I know a lot of people have been requesting it to come back so I'm going to make it come back. So again, thank you for all the support, okay? I really, really appreciate it. So currently we're at 20,900 subscribers. And if you guys want to know when I exactly upload, join the little blue button that says join right next to the subscribe button or just click on my main channel. And as soon as you see it, it'll ask you to join and you can, and you can find out when I upload because I will post about it right before I upload. So again, thank you for all the support. And without further ado, Spartanic out.